say too much about it because they may come and ask you to go help them. <laughs> I appreciate what they do. Uh, I'm grateful for the training that my wife and I received some years back from Child Evangelism Fellowship because she knows how to present the gospel to children and that is a necessary thing because many times when you get a group of 20 kids together some of them have never heard the gospel they have no idea what you're talking about so that's a good thing Dave appreciate that buddy when you were singing that I thought of Arthur Pink's quote or a quote from Arthur Pink it said the, Lord, the road to glory is all uphill and it is but it's worth the climb I'll say that <coughs> can you imagine the view when you get there that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> that has nothing to do with what we're going to look at this morning but that's okay it fits right in anyway take your Bible and turn to John 17 we're going to consider verses 8 to 12 as we continue examining Jesus prayer for his disciples this is the second installment in that series John chapter 17 verses 8 to 12 and I think Ruthie has informed me that this will be the last Sunday that I have to use this headset hopefully, hopefully if Amazon or whoever does what they're supposed to, to do Music okay. okay all right because you have no idea Putting it on is the aggravating part. Once I get it on and start talking, I forget about everything anyway. But, uh, when we first came here, this thing went over your head and been clipped over here. And it was pretty solid. But we had, uh, I think when our missionary was here, uh, the thing flopped all over the place when he was talking. So I guess I told him, I said, you need to wear glasses and you can put them on top of it. <laughs> but uh, let's read verses 8 to 12. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Father, we... We commit this time to you. This is very important as what we examine today has all kind of implications for us today. We realize this is Jesus' prayer for his men, his disciples, but they, the ways that we can apply this are many. And I pray that, Father, as we work our way through these few verses, you would help us see what it is you want us to do. And give us grace to do it. So we thank you for this time. Help us make the most of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is a continuation of, his, of Jesus' prayer for his disciples. And beginning in verse 8, the actual prayer for them begins. He mentioned just before that, uh, that was just kind of preliminary remarks. Now we begin to see and understand what it was that Jesus was praying for. And we have to read into verse all the way down to verse 11 before we see Jesus' actual request. And you've seen it. You heard it when I read it. What is it? Father, keep them in your word. That's his request. All the other is just preliminary sayings that are true and should be understandable. And God knows Every word Jesus is saying is true. And if Jesus prayed, knowing that the Father knows everything, then we ought to do the same. Prayer is not some magical formula that when we do it just right, it forces God into doing something that we need. No. Prayer is our communication with our Father. Because if we don't pray, 
half of our communication is not working. Amen. The other half is God's Word. He speaks to us through the written Word. And we speak to Him through the verbal Word. But it's not the manner in which we pray as much as it is the content of our prayer. I think it was John Bunyan that said, Rather let your words or your heart be without words than your words without heart. Jesus is talking with his Father and he's using words just like we use. So let's examine the content. For when we understand what Jesus is saying, it's a small step to see what we're supposed to do. In verse 8, we notice, and we're just following right through the text, number one, Jesus completed the job he was given. You say, well, what was the job he was given? Well, notice in the verse, he gave the disciples the words of his Father. For three years, probably a little more than that, the disciples heard the word of God from the Son of God. Jesus wove into different situations, the, the si different situations that he encountered, how God would act. That's exactly what he did with these men. And of course how we should act. And the disciples, on their part, they received God's words. And you'll notice here that what Jesus said, we often talk about accepting Christ when the scripture says, but as many as received him, and what that simply means is they understood what Jesus was saying and they believed every word that he said, every word that he spoke. So the disciples understood, and we follow right here in the text, Jesus' relation to the Father. Remember Peter's confession of faith? When Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? Now he knew the answer to that. But he wanted to hear what his men had to say. And Peter said, well, the disciples said, well, some say you're Elijah or one of the prophets. Well, who do you say that I am? And brash, outspoken, jump in the water. Before he knows how deep it is, Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. What a statement. What a statement. They knew Jesus was the Son of God because as that day they were rowing, well, it was in the evening, they were rowing across the lake to get to the other side and the weather got rough and Jesus came walking on the water. What would you think? Have you tried that? I've seen people walk on, you know, skis, but they had a motorboat in front of them, but Jesus didn't have any of that. They knew He was the Son of God and they saw and understood the relationship between Jesus and His Father. How did they see that? By the many times He left them and went away privately to pray. Now, many of those prayers are not recorded. We have no idea what Jesus talked about. And, of course, at the end of verse 8, the disciples believed God sent Jesus. The men that followed Christ now knew that God was the sender of His Son. Matter of fact, the word sent here is the word from which we get, where we get apostle. I often use this with children, and I don't have any uh, change in my pocket right now, but I have a large penny that is a mission. I could call it a missionary penny because it's one cent. Think about that. Uh, one cent. It's a wheat penny on the back. It's got, you know, wheat on the side of it, uh, which talks about if a, Jesus said, if a corn of wheat falls into the ground and does not die, it doesn't bear fruit. It has to die to one thing to become something else. And on and on. There's all kind of illustrations for children to see what a missionary is. So Jesus completed the job that he had been given, and that was to give God's words to his followers. That job was complete because as we find out when we get over to the book of Acts, many of the things that Jesus said were going to happen, they were surprised by them, but when they happened, then they remember. <coughs> then they remember. But let's go on. Number two, Jesus' request to God concerns his disciples only. Notice verse nine. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Now, what does that say? 
Well, Jesus says right here that he did not pray for the world. And remember, in John's writings, he uses the world in more than one way. I'll just give you three instances and you there's more. In John 3.16, which we all know, I had the youth quote that the other day and I was surprised they all quoted it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The word world there, and we often think that that is a verse that says God loves everybody exactly the same. That's not what it means, but it rather means that Jesus talking to Nicodemus who was a Jew and telling Nicodemus God loves people outside the race of Jews. You say, well, that would be the whole world, of course. But I want us to get the context right. World in John 3.16 refers to those outside the Jewish nation, not to the world in general. Does God have a love for His creation? Of course He does. And then secondly, in John 1, verse 29, the next day He saw Jesus coming to Him and said, this is John the Baptist, and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now if that means the whole world, then we have a serious problem. Because if Jesus takes the sins of everybody away, then everybody ought to go to heaven. So he uses the world here as to refer to those whom the Father has given to the Son. Exactly what he's talking about in verse 9 here in our text. Again, not to the world in general. 1 John 2.15 and John's smaller writings. Now this could get confusing if you read this. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Lord, why would you tell us not to love what you've created? Because that's not what the world means here. He's not talking about loving nature, loving the creation. He's talking about the world system. That's what John is talking about. The political, power-hungry world system. You see this very clearly in our day. How many times have you heard of a senator or a congressman having three or four houses in different parts of the country and then saying, we don't make enough money? Well, if you don't sell three or four of your houses for crying out loud, why is it our job to support their extravagant lifestyle? It's not our job. So again, this is not to the world in general. And here in verse 9, back in John 17, it refers to the world of men who were hostile to the gospel of peace. Now it could be debated whether or not Jesus ever prayed for unsaved. Ever. I'm not going to say one way or the other, but it could be debated. We're not specifically told that in Scripture. Of course, when Jesus prayed on the cross for His tormentors, what did He say? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And I believe that. That was a prayer, wasn't it? I would say yes. It, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Just some 60 days later, that prayer was answered on the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came with power and there were men from all over creation of the Roman Empire at least in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost and they heard the gospel in their own language spoken from people who did not know that language. You said, was that a miracle? Of course it was. Have you ever spoken in a language you didn't know? I have a hard time sometimes speaking in a language I do know. So Jesus makes this request because his men belong to God the Father. If I mentioned last week that Jesus spent the night in prayer before he chose those men. Now let's go on. Number three, Jesus and the Father are co-owners of the disciples. You see that in verse 10. You say, well, I don't like being owned by anyone. Well, you're owned by someone, whether you like it or not. I mean, yeah, we live in a free country. But does that mean you can do anything you want? Of course not. There are laws that govern that. The Father gave them to Jesus Christ. 
Jesus does not claim ownership except as co-owner. So all believers share this. He's my owner. He's my master. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. All of these give the idea of a lesser to a greater. This ownership glorifies both Father and the Son. You say, well, how can that be? I've known some Christians who didn't act very Christianly. Because what would these 11 and later to become 12 men with the addition of Matthias in the book of Acts, what would they do when Jesus left? They would take the gospel to the ends of the world. I did an interesting paper when I was in college on the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem. And it's interesting how that happens and what makes it happen. You remember what happened there in the book of Acts after Peter's great sermon there was 3,000 people saved and then just a, a week later he does something similar to that again and there's 4,000. That's 7,000 people in the early church with no building and no organization. And what happens? Well, they begin to organize. They're still meeting at the temple, but God says, wait a minute, guys. I did not give you my spirit for you to stay in Jerusalem. You need to get out. What did he do? Persecution came. What happened? They left. Oh, that was a terrible thing. No, that was a great thing because they took the gospel with them when they left. The disciples would be the ones to carry the gospel. To the world. Isn't it amazing 12 men could turn the world upside down? I'm talking about the known world at that time. And it's been doing it ever since. And we're to keep that tradition up right here in the big city of O'Brien, Florida. You don't know how many people live within a 17 mile radius of this church, do you? Over 20,000 people. In a 17 mile radius. You say well that would even go as far as Mayo. Yes it would. Close to it. Now don't get the wrong idea. When I say that God and, the, and Jesus own us. We're not slaves in the truest sense of the word. Because Jesus. Remember what he told his disciples. No longer do I call you slaves. Because a slave doesn't know what the master is doing. And Jesus said you will know what I'm doing. All you have to do is open the page of this book and read it. We are brothers with Christ and heirs with Him. I said, I, I said that word right. That's not A-I-R-S. That's H-E-I-R-S. The H is silent. My mother used to get on to me about that. It's not hairs, as you can probably tell. That has nothing to do with it. We are heirs with Christ. What He owns, we own. What does he own? Everything. <laughs> I like a bumper sticker said, my father owns a cattle on a thousand hills and he owns the hills the cattle are on. <laughs> we are brothers with Christ and heirs with him. According to scripture and even what we see here, do you realize that God is a dictator? So I don't even like that term. Well, sorry, that's what he is. But he's a loving, benevolent dictator. Those words usually don't go with dictator. You know, when Fidel Castro passed away, they didn't say he was a loving, benevolent dictator, did they? No. But God is. Loving. He cares about his creation. He cares about you and me. He cares about when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He cares about it when we walk through the valley of the shadow of cancer and all other kind of things. And he cares about it when we don't speak up when we ought to. He's loving and benevolent. But it's his way. And there is no highway option. Number four. You see it in verse 11. Jesus makes his request to the Father. This is where we've been going the whole time. Jesus knows he's going to depart, to depart from this world. He knows that. And the disciples will be left here. They need what? They need divine protection. As do we. So when you think about Jesus praying for you, don't get the wrong idea and think that he's praying so that 
you will be healed, even though he can very well do that. It's not a problem for the Son of God. But most of the time, Jesus' prayers have to do with our spirituality, our maturity level. What did he pray for the disciples for? That they may be one, Father, as you and I are one. So Jesus asked for the Father to keep them in his name. The idea is that when the name of the Father is honored, then His followers who keep that name will be honored. You say, well, Brother Keith, how do we keep His name? Well, I can give you all of the particular details, but let's just cut to the chase. How do we honor and keep the name of God? There's only one answer to that. By doing what He asks us to do. That's it. By being obedient children. And you say, well, when we do that, how does God keep us in His name? Well, first of all, because of the new birth. That means we're His children. None of His children will fall down and not get back up. You say, what do you mean by that? God keeps us. If He didn't, we would fall and fall quickly. Amen. Most theologians believe Adam and Eve were in the garden less than a day before they sinned. No, the, the writer of Proverbs says, a righteous man falls seven times and what? Gets back up. Seven being the number of divine completion. God's not going to let any of his children fall away and not bring them back. He will not do that. Because they're his children. And they're his children by adoption. I mentioned last Sunday. When you're adopted in our country, that's irrevocable. You can't unadopt somebody. And God doesn't do that. Jesus says that they may be one, Father, as you and I are one. What does that mean? Well, do you remember when you stood before a pastor or a justice of the peace or whatever you stood before a ship captain and said the I do things you remember that well I hope you remember that if you don't you need to be knocked upside the head do you remember what the, if they use the scripture most times a pastor will use this and the two become one flesh you say what does that mean well I can sign my name today and it covers my wife. She can do the same. That means she can represent me and I can represent her. When Jesus prays for us to be one as He and the Father are one, it simply means this, that they may be one in the Spirit. You say, what does that mean? See, a lot of these things need to be answered. One in the Spirit, what does that mean? One together with the Spirit. We're all headed in the same direction. That doesn't mean we all think exactly the same because if you're in a Baptist church very long, you will figure out we don't all think the same. No doubt about that. One in the Spirit and one in purpose because the Holy Spirit is the cement that holds us together. To just to... Put it bluntly and quickly. Matter of fact, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3, one of my favorite verses. Paul is encouraging the church of Ephesus, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now what makes that verse hard to understand? The word to and the word of and the word in. It makes it difficult. Now, if you take that and you look at that in the original language, you will see that this is, we are to keep the unity which the Spirit brings. Does the Spirit bring unity? What did He do on the day of creation? The Scripture says the Spirit of God hovered over the waters, almost like an incubation period, and what was chaos became order. The Holy Spirit still does that. Did He do that for you and for me? I remember the day I was saved. Do you? When I sat down in that chair in that Sunday school in Belvedere, South Carolina, I was in chaos. When I got up from that chair, I was in order. 
He brought order where there was chaos. He's still doing that. And in a church that's chaotic, and they can be sometimes, He brings order. And what's another word for order? Peace. Peace. And Paul even says, in the bond of peace. What, what does that mean? Well, you see, unity is kept when peace is the governing factor. In fact, we're even told in Scripture where to be at peace with all men, especially those of the household of faith, the church. You say, well, there's just somebody in the church that I can't get along with. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is we are to get along whether we get along or not. If we don't, there is a problem with us. We often think it's the other person. I know some of the things that I say a, a, a wife will do her husband like this or he will do his wife like that and said, boy, he was talking to you. <laughs> was he? Maybe he was talking to both of you. Amen. And maybe he was really talking to himself. We are to be at peace with all men. Does that mean, you know, when that terrible thing happened at that church in Texas, must have been a chaotic time. Especially the pastor being gone and his own and his daughter being killed in that. But peace is so important, especially in the church. And unity and peace are not at odds. They're together. Because you see, I remember the day I said I do in front of a our pastor at that time, he's going on to be with the Lord. And Debbie was there when there was a church full of witnesses to witness what I said. I remember that very clearly. But I also remember I didn't know what I was doing. I'm not saying I made a mistake. I just didn't know what I was doing. And I could probably get every man here to stand up and say I was in the same situation. I didn't know what I was doing either. But the interesting thing is because Debbie and I made it a, a pact, an agreement early in our marriage that God would be the one that held us together, even in the times when we have been at odds with one another, and there have been some of those times, God was still there fixing that situation and bringing order out of chaos. And He does that. If, so if you can have a relationship without God, I say, it doesn't work. It may appear to work. It may look like it works, but it doesn't. Well, let's go on. The fifth point that I wanted to make from this prayer, Jesus succeeded in keeping the ones the Father gave Him. You see that in verse 12. He succeeded in keeping the ones God gave Him. While Jesus was on this earth, He kept the disciples in the Father's name. Now, how did He do that? Well, it... An illustration of that is in John 6, 39. Listen. This is the will of Him who sent me, that of all He has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. Contrary to what some preachers say, and I use that term loosely when I say that, and I have read this, that oh, when you die and go to heaven, there you will walk through the gates of that city and you will see rooms there that are empty because of people who would reject. Wait a minute. How ridiculous is that? God knows those who are His. That's what the Scripture says. There's not going to be any empty rooms. No. Why? The only ones empty are the ones that haven't got there yet. That's the only ones empty. So this idea of keeping them in the Father's name means Jesus kept an eye on them all the time. <laughs> that's, that's the term we use, isn't it? We told, I told my children, I got eyes in the back of my head. So you can do things behind me and I'll know it. Now they didn't believe it then and they certainly don't believe it now. But I can imagine more than one time Michael and Matthew got together after they had been disciplined by their father and looking at one another and saying, how did he know that? <laughs> Jesus kept his eye on them. They were in the boat that night going across the sea and the weather got rough. Jesus kept an eye on them. How did he do that? He came walking on the water. Yes, he got into the boat. 
What's the old song say? His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Jesus said that in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, my father knows if one of the sparrows, and can you imagine how many of those there are, in this world dies, he knows about them. How much more does he know about what you and I are doing, what we're feeling, and what's going on inside? He guarded them, why? So that none of them perished, except Judas, that was prophesied, Judas did what he did. You say, well, he, was he made to do that? No. God never has to make us sin. All he has to do is leave us alone. He doesn't have to make us sin. Judas. And Judas was prophesied. So this happened. Judas' betrayal happened so the scripture would not be broken. And they were not. Let me make a bold statement right here, folks. According to what I have read up to this point, every word of God will come to pass. Every word of God will come to pass. This I took from the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith or called the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. I love this. Listen to what it says. I think it's on the screen. And this is, like I said, 1689, so it would have been King James English. God hath decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeable, all things whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so as thereby is God neither the author of sin nor hath fellowship with any therein, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, nor yet is a liberty or a contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. That is worth memorizing. Every word of God will come to pass. What did Peter say in his second letter? He said, there are some who think because Jesus hasn't returned yet that he's not coming. Well, that's ridiculous, isn't it? That's not even logical. And yet many people are not. But God had decreed in Himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of His own will freely and unchangeably all things whatsoever comes to pass. You can believe this above all else. <clears throat> You see, if you belong to Jesus Christ, as the song says, you are safe and secure from all alarms. He has prayed for you, and He still does. But in contradiction to our prayers and His prayers, His prayers are always answered. as he wants them answer. Why is that not the case with us? Because we don't know what his will is. What did Jesus tell us in the model prayer? Pray that God's will will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. And when we do, and if we spend the time we will find out what God wants. It doesn't matter if it's a new house we plan to buy or a new job or a new family member or whatever. If we pray and ask, God will tell us. We just don't want to do that though. I know. I'm just as stubborn as you are. <laughs> when we pray for God's will to be done and we know what it is, we can pray more effectively. Jesus knew what the Father's will was for all things and He prayed for those things to happen and what happened? Happened they did. That's the great difference between our prayer and His. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, He said, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. 
He said, what is that telling us? You don't belong to you. You belong to him. Amen. He bought you. You say, what was the price? The blood of his son. That was the price. Amen. And he thought you were worth it. I did this or read this. Debbie showed me this some time back. And I, I did it once before. But I just wanted to, because we often think, you know, and especially true of women, not all women, but many women, they don't think they're worth very much. Well, let me show you. If this $20 bill, I can write on it, and guess what it's still worth? $20. Yep. Yeah. I can tear it in half, and guess what it's still worth? $20. I can drop it in water. I can put concrete or mud on it, and it's still worth $20. If God thinks you're worth it, you are. You say, preacher, what are you doing with $20? Well, my wife gave it to me this morning. That's why. If it wasn't for her, my uh, allowance is usually $1 a week. And I go through that on the same day that I get it. So you say, well, well, preacher, why do I belong to Christ? Because of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why. Because it was there that you traded your sin for His righteousness. And He was obliging to do just that. Our will is not our own. Our main goal in life is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So on this last week of November 2017, will you surrender all to Him? You will not regret it. You will never regret it. A lady came to a pastor one time and she said, Pastor, I've tried Jesus and He didn't work. You know what the wise pastor told her? You didn't try him. Because he always works. He always works. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for Jesus and this prayer for his disciples and in time for us. And Lord, I thank you that Jesus is praying right now. And you hear every word. And you will answer. Lord, I pray that you would change our understanding of prayer to realize we need to pray as to what you want to happen and not what we want to happen. We need to line up what we want to happen with what you want to happen. And then our prayers will always be answered. So Father, we need to spend the time to find out what you want. And I pray that through the course of this sermon today, we realize that. And we realize, Father, that we don't belong to ourselves, even though we live in a free country and we can do much of what we want, we can't do everything we want. But, Father, we belong to you because we have been bought with blood. And the bad thing is, or the good thing is, there's no bad feelings about this. When we get to heaven, Jesus is not going to look at us and say, I'm sorry that I died for you. He wasn't. He isn't. He never will be. Father, we can rejoice in that. He was willing to do that for you and me. And Father, I pray that would change us from this point on. During our time of commitment, Father, do what you need to do. And may we do the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of, is 337.